whose picture went viral is offered a new home in the United States by a six-year-old. Dear President Obama, remember the boy who was picked up by the ambulance in Syria? Can you please go get him and bring him to our home? Welcome to the programme. Food and emergency supplies for some 40,000 people are arriving into a suburb of the Syrian capital, Damascus. The first major delivery of aid in Syria this month comes as fresh fighting breaks out across the country. In an interview today, Syria's President Assad was uncompromising, saying his enemies alone, including the US, are to blame for the devastation across the country. The BBC's James Landale reports. Around Aleppo last night, there was anything but a ceasefire. These unverified pictures show warplanes dropping incendiary bombs in what is said to be rebel-held territory. At least 45 people were reported to have died. And elsewhere in Syria, including the central provinces of Hama and Homs, there seems little left of what truce there was. In an interview with the Associated Press news agency, President Assad was defiant, denying he was besieging eastern Aleppo and denying he was using barrel bombs to kill civilians. Bomb is a bomb. What's the difference between different kinds of bombs? All bombs are to, to kill, but it's about how to use it. When you use armament, you use it to defend the civilians. You kill terrorists in order to defend civilians. We don't kill civilians because we don't have the moral incentive. We don't have the interest to kill civilians. The war, he said, would drag on while outside powers interfered, and he blamed America for the breakdown of the latest ceasefire. I believe that the United States is not genuine uh, regarding uh, having cessation of violence in Syria. And as for the attack on Monday that destroyed a humanitarian convoy and killed 20 aid workers, he denied any involvement. Regarding the claim of the White House yesterday, accusing either the Syrian or the Russian in that regard, I would say uh, whatever the American officials said about the conflict in Syria in general has no credibility. Whatever they say, it just lies. Today, his forces gain control of yet more territory as more than 100 rebel fighters and their families were evacuated from opposition-held districts in Homs. Elsewhere, a United Nations aid convoy did get through to a rebel-held suburb of Damascus. But so far, none has been allowed into Aleppo, something the UN said had to change. Please, uh, President Assad, do your bit to enable us to get to eastern Aleppo and also the other besieged areas. But aid will reach here only if there's a ceasefire. And although there'll be yet more talks at the UN this evening, there are few hopes that the fighting will end anytime soon. James Land, LBC News. Well, my colleague Laura Trevelyan is at the United Nations. Laura, James said just then there will be more talks today at the United Nations between the US and Russia, but it's a tense time, isn't it? It is, yeah. What's happening this afternoon is the US and Russia will lead talks of an international group of 20 countries who will come together on Syria. But the principles are indeed the US Secretary of State John Kerry and his Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov. And those two were at loggerheads so publicly yesterday when the UN Security Council met in public session. So the question is, what can these two do to revive their ceasefire deal that came into effect last Monday and is now pretty much in tatters? And other countries in the Syria group will tell you it's all down to what the Russians and the Americans can agree. If they can in some way revive this ceasefire agreement and lead to a new round of talks in Geneva, well, that would be something. But the question is how. The Russians have suggested that perhaps there could be a three-day pause. That's been quoted in some of the wire services. I mean, while the Americans suggested yesterday at the Council that there should be a pause in military operations over key areas of Syria where aid is being delivered. So, is there any wriggle room between these two positions? We'll see what happens after that meeting, uh, which is due to start in the next hour. Well, we'll all be watching the BBC's Laura Trevelyan at the United Nations. Thanks very much for joining us. 
Now, Charlotte's police chief says he sees no reason to impose a curfew in North Carolina's largest city, despite two nights of violent protests after the shooting of a black man by a police officer. These were the scenes in Charlotte overnight into Thursday as police and protesters clashed. The rallies began after Keith Lamont Scott was shot dead by police just two days ago. Officials say Mr Scott was armed. His family say he wasn't. Mr Scott was the third black man to be killed by US police in a week. One protester remains in a critical condition after they were shot last night. Well, the mayor of Charlotte, Jennifer Roberts, is appealing for peaceful protests. We'll hear from her in just a moment. But first, the local chief of police, Kerry Putney, has also been speaking. He says police video doesn't show Mr Scott pointing a gun, but says the footage does back up the officer's versions of events. This is how he responded when he asked if the video would be made public. If there is compelling information that I think helps, we'll show it. But again, I'm going to be... Uh, I'm going to be very intentional about protecting the integrity of the, of the investigation and in so doing, I'm not going to release the video um, right now. The video does not give me absolute definitive um, visual evidence that, um, that would confirm that a person is pointing a gun. I did not see that in the videos that I've reviewed. So, uh, what I can tell you, though, is when taken in the totality of all the other evidence, it supports what we've heard and the version of the truth that we gave about the circumstances that happened that led to the death of Mr. Scott. The safety and security of our community, as well as our law enforcement officers, remains our top priority. Today, our city is open for business as usual, and we let people know, come to our uptown, we are here working, uh, our buses are running, we are here to serve, and the city is open. Well, our correspondent Gary O'Donoghue is in Charlotte for us. Gary, two very different accounts of what happened. What are the chances of this video footage from police body cameras and the dash cam actually being made public? Pretty small, to be honest. The police chief made that quite clear this morning. He believes that would inter interfere with the investigation that he's conducting. He says there's also another complication which is that the State Bureau of Inve Investigation may take over some parts of the investigation and therefore it would be up to them to decide whether or not to release that video. So he's pretty adamant at the moment that it's not going to be made public. He does, however, say that he's going to show it to the family at their request. And I think they'll be hoping, certainly, that that will if, well, in effect, persuade the family enough that the police account of what happened is closer to the truth than theirs. Now, that may be a pretty high bar to get over, I suspect, for the family, but that must be part of the hope. And given what he said in the clip you heard there about it not being definitively clear that a, a gun was being pointed in that video, I suspect the family will want to see what else he has to, that convinces him that actually Mr Scott was a threat to, to his officers. So there's a lot, lot of ground between the two sides on this already. And in the meantime, of course, we're into late afternoon, mid to late afternoon, and people are starting to cast their minds forward to this evening and whether or not there'll be a repeat of the last two nights, something everyone's hoping will not happen. And Gary, just briefly, um, there won't be a curfew as of now, but uh, what is the mood there at the moment ahead of another night? Well, I mean, walking the streets here, you wouldn't know that anything really had happened. There's a few boarded up windows here and there on East Trade Street, a bit of broken glass there this morning, but they've done a pretty good job at cleaning up. But I think people are waiting and seeing. They're waiting to see exactly what information the police will release. We're promised other information from them other than the video, by the way. And then we're waiting to see what the family's reaction will be to seeing that video, getting sight of that, that body cam video. That will be crucial, I think. People still are uh, appealing for calm, of course, and the National Guard will be on the streets protecting buildings. But I think, uh, I think people are, are wary about tonight because there is a, a mood amongst some of those protesters to, to punish the police for what they perceive 
as crimes against black people. Well, thank you very much, Gary O'Donoghue, who will be uh, with you throughout the day and watching developments in Charlotte. Now, it's one of the worst disasters of the Mediterranean migrant crisis. Hundreds of people are feared dead after a boat which set sail from Egypt capsized on Wednesday. Survivors have told the BBC there were around 550 people on board, but only 160 could be rescued. The disaster happened 19 kilometres from the shore, near the town of Rosetta, where four crew members have been arrested. From there, our correspondent Orla Gurin reports. Reclaimed from the sea, survivors of the latest tragedy in the Mediterranean. Saved by the Egyptian military, but taken into police custody. Some overwhelmed by exhaustion, after up to eight hours treading water and staring death in the face. Most were young Egyptians from poor communities who told us they wanted to reach Italy to find work. They said more than 550 people were crammed onto the boat. It was very small, said Ahmed Halid, who's 17. It only had room for 200. We were at sea for days and they kept bringing more people. Before we capsized, half the crew got away. Mohammed Shaban survived, but without his cousin Amr, who was just 14. May God have mercy on Amr and all the young men who died. I was going to die, but God helped me. God and the army were recited the prayer before death. Not once, but 10 or 15 times. We said, God help us, God save us. Outside the police station, anguish and anger. Some relatives complaining the authorities took hours to respond to distress signals from the sinking boat. But then, what they'd all been waiting for. Well, the survivors are emerging now. They've spent the night in custody. They're being reunited with their families. Many of the relatives have been maintaining a vigil here right through the night, hoping against hope to get news of their loved ones, hoping that they were not among the dead. The BBC's Ola Guerin reporting there from the Egyptian Mediterranean coast. Now let's take a look at some of the day's other news. Iraqi government forces say they fought their way into the center of the strategically important town of al-Shirkat, which has been in the hands of Islamic State militants since 2014. The army's effort to capture the town is part of an attempt to secure supply routes ahead for what's expected to be a very much bigger battle for the city of Mosul, which lies further to the north. Around three and a half million people in Puerto Rico are without electricity for the second day running. The blackout began on Wednesday after a fire at a power plant set off a broader outage across the island's utility grid. People were forced to spend the night in darkness and without air conditioning in the tropical heat, and businesses have been forced to close. Officials say it could be 24 hours before power's restored. A Chinese lawyer whose clients included the dissident artist Ai Weiwei has been sentenced to 12 years in prison after being convicted of fraud. Zia Lin's supporters and his wife strongly reject the charges, saying he was being persecuted for challenging the government. He's the latest of several human rights lawyers and activists to be jailed in China in recent months. The Afghan government signed a draft peace agreement with the country's second biggest militant group. A representative of militant leader Gulbuddin Hekmatia signed the deal on live television. He'll be granted immunity from prosecution in return for his support for the constitution and a promise to abandon violence. Human rights groups say he's responsible for the deaths of possibly thousands of people during the 1990 civil war. Next, they're tiny. So how dangerous can button batteries, which are often found in toys and watches, be? Well, doctors are warning about the potentially lethal risk they pose to children and babies. Surgeons at London's Great Ormond Street Hospital say they've seen a rise in the number of children suffering severe injuries, sometimes even dying after swallowing them. Our medical correspondent, Fergus Walsh, reports. Yes. Steady, go. All it took was a tiny watch battery to devastate this little girl's health. 
After she swallowed the button battery, it burned through Valeria's food and windpipes. This is the latest of many operations at London's Great Ormond Street Hospital to try to repair the damage. For the past year, the three-year-old has been fed through a tube into her stomach and has a bag to collect her saliva. Her mother, Jelena, who's Russian, says it has turned their lives upside down. She hopes Valeria will eventually recover. Essentially, this battery starts working in the esophagus. Surgeons at Great Ormond Street Hospital are seeing one child a month with caustic soda burns caused by button batteries. The most important thing is to be aware that these are extremely dangerous and should be treated essentially like a poison and be kept out of the reach of children. Let's mimic what can happen when a button battery gets lodged in a child's throat. The ham represents the delicate lining of the esophagus and water, saliva. I'll cover this side, but put another battery here so we can see the chemical reaction that happens. We've left this for just two hours and already a huge amount of damage has been done. If I lift the button battery, you can see all this black marked area. Eventually, this would have burnt its way right through the ham. Same thing with the child's throat. When Amari from Newcastle swallowed a button battery last year, doctors warned her mum there could be life-changing injuries. They said that her vocal cords could be damaged then and there and she would never actually in fact develop a voice. And again, they'd said that if she did pull through, she may never eat again because the esophagus may have been too badly damaged. Just truly terrifying. Getting ready for, 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 for her party today. Fortunately, the two-year-old has made a complete recovery, but it's a warning to parents to keep toddlers away from button batteries. Fergus Walsh, BBC News. Well, in a few days' time, the US election campaign will ramp up a notch as the first presidential debate takes place on Monday. It'll be must-see viewing as Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump go head-to-head -head for the first time on a range of issues. It's a crucial moment for both campaigns, so how do you prepare for such a big event? Well, my colleague Cathy Kay has been finding out. <laughs> The presidential debates give American voters the only chance they have to compare the candidates side by side. The stakes are enormous. And in this election, the biggest challenge for Hillary Clinton is how do you debate someone like Donald Trump? There's never been a candidate or a debater quite like him. How tough is it a to lot take of a times property from an elderly talk. woman? Let me talk. Quiet. Trump doesn't do traditional debate prep with its policy briefings and in-depth analysis. He prefers off-the-cuff remarks and almost childlike insults. I call him Lion Ted. He holds the Bible high and then he goes down, he puts the Bible down and then he lies. Lion Ted. During the Republican primaries, Todd Harris was the senior advisor for Senator Marco Rubio, the man Trump witheringly dismissed as little Marco. Our strategy for most of the campaign was to ignore all of Trump's insults, but the challenge with that was that the media wasn't ignoring any of them. The best thing for Hillary Clinton in terms of uh, debating Trump would be for her to just not show up at all. The best way to engage with Trump is to let Trump hang himself with his own words and with all of his inconsistencies. Rubio discovered the cost of a bad debate on February the 6th in New Hampshire. Under attack, Rubio repeated himself four separate times. And let's dispel once and for all with this fiction that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. This notion that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing is just not there true. There it is. He knows exactly what he's doing. There it is, the memorized 25-second speech. Well, Within hours, the internet was buzzing with jokes about Marco Roboto. Arguably, his campaign ended that night which is why debate prep is taken so seriously by both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. 
she has briefing books and and um, uh, and she talks about debate strategy with campaign veterans and she will do mock debates with someone standing in for Trump. I don't believe we've been told yet who exactly is going to stand in for Trump. That'll be an interesting role for someone to play. Debate is over. Donald Trump got the first word. Tonight he got the last word as well as he's going to... Donald Trump doesn't debate the way anyone debates. He does his Donald Trump thing. He uh, projects strength. He uses some of the moves he learned as a reality television star. But he does it in a way that's completely different from anyone I've ever seen on a debate stage. President Obama has also learned that election debates can hurt a candidate just as much as they can help them. On October 3, 2012, Obama met Mitt Romney in Denver for their first debate. It was a disaster. Are we going to double down on the top-down economic policies that helped to get us into this mess, or do we embrace a new economic patriotism? Obama was tetchy and distracted. He gave the impression he didn't want to be there. Stephanie Cutter was the president's deputy campaign manager. It was pretty clear that we were losing, not just by what we were watching on TV, but the commentary that we were seeing develop. For the first time, Twitter was, um, was a decisive factor for how that debate was covered. So we knew what we were dealing with, and we started charting out how we were going to make changes, even before that debate ended. President Obama recovered in later debates, but those around him suggested one big problem in Denver was that he underestimated his opponent. Political scientists don't agree how much the debates actually help you win the White House. The polls are inconclusive. What they do know is that this will be box office must-see television. And don't expect the candidates to play it safe, just wooing the voters in the middle. Instead, they will be trying to scare the living daylights out of their own supporters at the very prospect of the other person on the stage occupying the Oval Office. That will mean a lot of sharp attacks. Not necessarily edifying, but certainly entertaining. Katty Kay, BBC News, Washington. And it will be a political event like no other, and that debate is on Monday night. Next, when a six-year-old American boy wrote a letter to Barack Obama, he probably didn't expect the president himself to read it out to world leaders. Alex from New York penned a note to the president offering a Syrian refugee a place to stay with his family. It was after he saw the photograph of Omran Dagnish, the little boy seen dazed and bloodied in the back of an ambulance. The letter went viral. Mr Obama read some of it at this week's UN summit on refugees. Here's Alex. Dear President Obama, remember the boy who was picked up by the ambulance in Syria? Can you please go get him and bring him to our home? Park in the driveway or on the street, and we'll be waiting for you guys with flags, flowers, and balloons. We will give him a family, and he will be our brother. Catherine, my little sister, will be collecting butterflies and fireflies for him. In my school, I have a friend from Syria, Omar, and I will introduce him to Omar, and we can all play together. We can invite him to birthday parties, and he will teach us another language. Since he won't bring toys and doesn't have toys, Catherine will share her big blue stripy white bunny, and I will share my bike, and I will teach him how to ride it. I will teach him addition, addition and subtraction. Those are the words of a six-year-old boy. He teaches us a lot. The, the humanity that a young child can display, who hasn't learned to be cynical or suspicious or fearful of other people because of where they're from or how they look or how they pray, we can all learn from Alex. Six years old. The power of the pen, that's the story of Alex. Now, Britain's Prince William's told a conference that he fears the African elephant will have disappeared from the wild by the time his daughter, Princess Charlotte, turns 25. He said action needs to be taken now to stop poaching and that it's time to send an unambiguous message that it's no longer acceptable to buy or sell ivory or rhino horn. 
And just before we go, we would like to recognise the BBC teams who won an Emmy last night for their continuing coverage of the European migrant crisis. We've been privileged to bring you their report and congratulations to all involved. And of course, you can see more of our coverage anytime by going to our smartphone app or our website, bbc.com news.